Amen. Good to be in church this morning. Let's go ahead and open in a word of prayer. Our Father, we thank you, Lord, for your many blessings and uh, for your uh, goodness in our lives. We thank you for salvation and uh, that you hear and answer our prayers. And Lord, we pray this morning that you might meet with us and uh, that your Holy Spirit would be among us, that it would be evident that we were in the house of God today. And we'll thank you for all that you do for us and through us. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Let's all stand one more time. 592. I love to tell the story. Page 592.
Let's go ahead and sing our theme song, Have Faith in God, as we find our places. Have faith in God each and every day. Have faith in God every step of the way. Have faith in God when the trial comes. Have faith in God when the victory is won. Living by faith in God above. Let's sing it one more time. Have faith in God each and every day. Have faith in God every step of the way. Have faith in God when a trial comes. Have faith in God when the victory is won. Living by faith in God above. Resting each day in His mercy and love. Have faith in God is what Jesus said. Have faith. Have faith in God, have faith, have faith in God. Amen. You may be seated. All right. Got a few announcements for us this morning. Uh, prayer meeting tonight at 515. If you're able to come and be here with us for that and uh, participate, we'd appreciate uh, all the people gathering together, if you can make it out for that, and uh, we'll spend some time uh, seeking the Lord. Um, April Call to Glory is on the hall table in the back there, and um, uh, so you can get uh, that early here. I guess it's not early, is it? It's almost April. Can you believe it? Time just flies. Uh, Senior Saints Prayer Meeting Tuesday at 10 uh, a.m., and so keep that in mind. We'll begin weekly visitation this coming Thursday, so that March 31st, uh, and that will be, be starting at 645, and so keep that in mind. Um, and then our track challenge for the month of April uh, will begin on um, the first Sunday in April, and if you noticed in your bulletins, we've got a sheet with all the teams on it, so you can check out who's on your team, and you can encourage them, admonish them, exhort them, that was our Sunday school lesson, 
upstairs this morning. So those are the words on my mind. But you can admonish and exhort one another to pass out as many tracts as you can. So if your name is not on here, we didn't do that on purpose. Um, come see me and we'll, we'll make sure you get on a team. Uh, but your name should be, on, should be on the list there. And so figure out whose team you're on. And your team captain is up at the top. It's either Bill and Gail Caldwell, John and Barb Norman, or Terry and Teresa Turner. And so each Sunday, what we'll do is you just let them know how many tracks you passed out during the course of the week. One stipulation, you have to hand it to somebody. You can't leave 100 tracks at a, at a gas station at the, on the toilet <laughs> or at a, at a, a you know, at a, uh, what do you call it, a restaurant, you know, in the hallway, uh, you have to hand it to a person. That's the idea. And so that's the, that's the challenge. And we'll see how many we can pass out. And so keep that all in mind. And I'm excited to see what the Lord does. Um, you know, I mentioned last week, 2000, I just kind of brought that number off, off the, off the cuff, so to speak. And, um, then I thought about it after I left and I thought, you know, if we have a hundred people passing out 2000 tracks, it would be 20 per person. So that's five a week. So how many people can hand out one? I mean, we can hand out one a week or one a day, surely. And that would be seven if you count Saturday and Sunday. So I went to, uh, I went to the grocery store yesterday cause we needed a couple little things. And so on my way back from the church to home, I stopped at the go grocery store and I put a few tracks from the car into my pocket and I walked in and during the course of me walking around, I handed out three gospel tracks in the grocery store yesterday. So it's not that hard. You just hand it to somebody and say, I'll give you an invitation to the church or figure out something funny to say, you know, or, um, you know, just whatever in your own personality, in your own way, uh, you can figure out something to hand somebody a gospel track. And so that's the challenge. Let's see what we can do this, uh, this next month in handing out gospel tracts. I think we can hit the 2,000 mark. Um, I think that'll be a good, a good number. Uh, there'll be a youth rally Saturday, April 9th. There is a sign-up sheet on the front here um, that we'll get going around here in a moment. If somebody, one of the ushers maybe can grab that when you come up, and we'll get that going around uh, Saturday, April 9th. And that will be at the Fernwood Christian Camp in Beaver Falls. Departure from the church here will be at 930. It's free to attend. You will just need a little money for a meal on the way to the rally. Um, when you get home, you'll probably be pretty hungry because it'll be probably 730, 8 o'clock is what I'm thinking. Uh, somewhere in that time frame. And we can keep up with your parents as we get closer. Um, or if you drive, that's fine too. So. Uh, but we'll leave here at 9.30, bring a little money, spending money, and we'll get back around um, 8 o'clock or so. 7.30, 8 o'clock is the plan. Um, our uh, Resurrection Sunday Easter services will be, will be starting our sunrise service at 7.30 at the Fellowship Center. I know it's not quite sunrise. It's a little after sunrise, but we don't want to, you know, we have five kids. 7.30 is early enough. Uh, and then we'll have, immediately following that, there will be our breakfast, our Easter breakfast, and then our uh, special service at 10.30. Uh, we will not be having services in the evening that day, uh, so just keep all that in mind. Missions Conference is coming up April 22nd through 24th, so keep that in mind on your calendar. Uh, and then also a work church work day, Saturday, April 30th. We will begin at 8.30, or I mean 8 a.m., and there is a sign-up sheet uh, with details will be available soon. And so we don't have that yet. But uh, that will come in April. We'll get that sign-up sheet uh, running around so we know who's here so we can coordinate all the work. There's lots of stuff to be done. And uh, so we, uh, we hope that you can help with all of that. And uh, that will be a blessing. Um, and then the mother-daughter banquet, ladies' banquet, will, is scheduled for Saturday, May 14th at noon. And there will be a sign-up sheet and details on all that coming soon so keep that in mind and that is on your calendar if you've still got your calendar if you don't there's some in uh, in a drawer back here and uh, so if you don't have or you lost your bookmark or your uh, magnet um, there's more just ask me we'll get you one um, a couple more things I do have a, a thank you note to read uh, it says dear community Baptist Church family thank you all for the prayers cards uh, when we were sick 
we hope that you know how important it is to us to have such a loving family. May God bless you all. And that is from Jerry, Donna, and Dave LaRock. And so they just wanted to say thank you for all the prayers and cards, etc. cetera, uh, during, that, during their time of sickness. One more thing. Uh, last week, we took up a special offering for Paul and Susan Hamilton. They're in Moldova, and for those of you who don't know or may be visiting with us this morning, uh, they are dealing with refugees coming through from Ukraine, and uh, they're uh, 25, 30 people a day that they're feeding. Um, and so last week, we took up a special offering. The total was $3,135. And so praise God for your generosity and uh, in that. Um, we did communicate with them this week. Uh, we, Teresa sent an email just to you know, make sure we are sending the check to the right place and you know, getting with them in regards to what their continued needs will be. And so he sent a short response back. And so I'm going to read that this morning. Um, it says, uh, greetings in Jesus' name. We have been preaching the word of God for 25 years. I am uh, here for the long term. We have five churches I'm responsible for. I pastor two of those churches. I travel 423 miles a week preaching. You know, we were staying at Bob's house, and it's what, 25, 30 minutes back and forth. And when gas prices go up, you start feeling it, right? And so, but they're traveling 423 miles. Well, I'm not complaining about how far I had to drive, right? <laughs> Uh, this tragedy in Ukraine is a catastrophe. God has put us in a, in a uh, position to really minister. We are ministering to suffering, hurting people. We go to the border town of Palanca three days a week, passing out tracts. Our Hannah House for Girls has been turned into a Ukrainian refugee center. We have 25 people we are feeding three meals a day. We have bought them clothes, medicine, etc. Many come to us shocked because they have been bombed out of their houses. Yesterday, they bombed the town of Kershon, Ukraine. Many of the people that were coming through the border are from the hospitals. We help two of our missionaries in Ukraine with food for the soldiers, plus we are helping people in our city of Balti who are taking care of the refugees. And uh, he sent another response regarding the money, but that's just a little bit in regards to what they're doing. Um, and so what I'd like to do is just keep an ongoing fund for them for, for the next two, three, four months, whatever. So once a month, when we send them their regular support, we will send them whatever comes in. So if you want to designate something, maybe you weren't here last week, or maybe you couldn't give what you wanted to last week, uh, you know, we're not going to take up one big special offering like that, but each week as you're able, you can give toward that, and each month we'll send them a check with the, uh, you know, those given funds uh, toward, uh, just toward their work there. And uh, so that way we can continue to be a blessing. We did have somebody ask, you know, I, I think they didn't, weren't able to be here, or didn't have the funds with them or something. And so we do want to make that available so that, you know, you can give on an ongoing basis if you'd like to, or if you missed it, you can, uh, you know, be a part of that offering as well. And so praise the Lord for that. Praise the Lord for your generosity. Thank you again for your help with that. And also um, thank you again for your help the last couple of weeks with our move. Uh, we've been very blessed. Um, just um, the outpouring of, of you all helping us move. It's uh, been a tremendous blessing uh, just in all of the different, uh, you know, things, wood and, and gravel and help with moving and help with cleaning and painting and meals and just all the stuff. And so thank you so much uh, from our family uh, just for all that you've done for us. And uh, we just look forward to many years of, of serving together with you. We're excited about our new house. We've, we've moved in, uh, but we got boxes all over the place still. And so there's lots of boxes to unpack, lots of work to do. So um, anyway, we, we just appreciate you all. And uh, let's go ahead and receive our offering. Brother McGee.
Man, good singing. Watch again. Be seated. This morning, Becky and Cindy. Oh, I'm sorry. No, excuse me. Excuse me. Wrong. Scripture reading. So why don't you stand again? Sorry, I shouldn't have had you sit. Why don't you stand again? We're going to go ahead and do our scripture reading. Between the two of us, we'll eventually get it right. I've noticed myself making a couple of wonders the last few weeks and Habakkuk chapter 3, Habakkuk um, chapter 3, and uh, we'll read a few verses there. Um, I'll give you a moment to find it. <clears throat> it is after Nahum, and it's before Zephaniah, if that helps. Habakkuk chapter 3. Habakkuk 3, verse 1, a prayer of Habakkuk, the prophet, upon Siganoth. O Lord, I have heard thy speech and was afraid. O Lord, revive thy work in the midst of the years. In the midst of the years, make known in wrath, remember mercy. Our text is going to be verse 3. God came from Teman, and the Holy One from Mount Paran, Selah. His glory covered the heavens, and his earth was full of praise. And his brightness was as the light. He had horns coming out of his hand, and there was the hiding of his power. Before him went the pestilence, and burning coals went forth at his feet. He stood and measured the earth, and behold, and drove asunder the nations. And the everlasting mountains were scattered. The perpetual hills did bow. His ways are everlasting. Father, we thank you, Lord, for your goodness, your blessings, your love to us. We pray that you would speak to our hearts through the word of God this morning. May all that's said and done be, be uh, able to glorify you, to lift up our Savior, and uh, just to uh, speak um, to hearts. I uh, Help us uh, to have open hearts to hear what you have for us this morning. We'll thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Stripes were made within Pilate's 
Amen. Junior Church can be dismissed. Before I forget that. Habakkuk chapter 3 and verse 3 says, God came from Teman and the Holy One from Mount Paran, Selah. His glory covered the heavens and the earth was full of his praise. Uh, Habakkuk identifies himself as a prophet in chapter 1 in the opening verse. And uh, due to the liturgical nature of the book of Habakkuk, there have been many scholars who think that the author may have been what they call a temple prophet, maybe something like a singing prophet. Uh, Temple prophets or a singing prophet would be described in 1 Chronicles chapter 25 and verse 1. And uh, they would use psalteries and harps and cymbals, and these were prophets that were singing prophets. Um, Some feel that uh, chapter 3, verse 19, would echo that sentiment where he says at the end of the chapter to the chief singer, upon my stringed instruments. So Habakkuk was something of a singing prophet. He was a prophet, he was a singer. Um, and uh, so here we have uh, this book uh, of a somewhat of a uh, song book, so to speak. Although his name does not appear anywhere else in the Bible, rabbinic tradition holds Habakkuk to be the Shunammite woman's son who was restored to life in Elisha uh, in 2 Kings 4, verse 16. However, others, like Matthew Henry, say that it is more probable that he lived and prophesied during the reign of Manasseh when evil abounded and destruction of Jerusalem was imminent. So it's unknown when Habakkuk lived and preached, but the reference to the rise and advance of the Chaldeans in chapter 1, verses 6 through 11, would place him in the middle to the last quarter of the 17th century B.C., Some believe during the period of Jehoiakim's reign from 609 to 598 B.C. And of course the reasoning for that, uh, during his reign, the Babylonian Empire and the Chaldeans were growing in power. The Babylonians marched against Jerusalem in 598 B.C. While they were marching, Jehoiakim passed away and died and his son Jehoiakim assumed the throne. So the Babylonians, upon their arrival, uh, Jehoiakim and his advisors surrendered Jerusalem after just a short period of time. With the transition of the rulers and the young age and inexperience of Jehoiakim, they were not able to stand against the Chaldean forces. And so they relinquished control and surrendered. But regardless of the exact years, this was the time in which Habakkuk was written. 
And uh, Habakkuk wrote this prophetic songbook, as you might call it. So in chapter 1, we find in verses 3 and 4, he says, Why dost thou show me iniquity and cause me to behold grievance? For spoiling and violence are before me, and there are that rise up strife and contention. Therefore the law is slacked, and judgment doth never go forth. For the wicked compass about the righteous, therefore wrong judgment proceedeth. We see the perversion of the people of the land in that day. And Habakkuk is crying out about it, and he's frustrated about it. The perversion of these people when wrong becomes right, and right becomes wrong. Do we not live in a time today that, just like Habakkuk lived in, when the world seems to be turned upside down, and you've got right is now paraded as wrong, uh, as wrong and wrong is now paraded as right. And it's all upside down. When evil is paraded in the streets, when the righteous are mocked, because they hold a standard and hold a line and hold to right and wrong. The Bible says in 2 Timothy 3, verse 13, but evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. Do we not live in a time where it seems like everybody is being deceived and duped in our culture today? When you have a man who becomes a woman and now... Uh, wins the women's swimming race. I mean, it's just absolutely insanity. The Bible says in 2 Timothy, this know also that in the last days perilous times shall come, for men shall be lovers of their own selves. Do we not have that today? Every man for himself, every man did that which is right in his own eyes. Covetousness. People are just hungry for stuff. They, everybody wants what they want, and they're just covetous. And uh, when you've got people... Uh, kicking uh, and hitting and knocking themselves, knocking others down, racing on Good on Good Friday, yeah, on Black Friday, trying to get the the deals. Uh, do we not live in a covetous time? Boasters, uh, do we not have uh, you know most sports, most pro sports today, uh, are hardly worth watching because you've got uh, people who are. Uh, just proclaiming themselves, and uh, I just don't want to get too deep into that. Uh, but, you know, they've, they've become boasters and, and covetous and uh, lovers of their own selves, proud, blasphemers. Do we not live in a culture today where uh, people will take God's name in vain? They will say bad and wicked words just out in the open and have no shame to it. We were in a store... The other day, my daughter and my wife were uh, in a store the other day, and my daughter, who I, is 14 right now, so I don't know how long ago this was, a few months ago maybe, and uh, a lady said an incredibly bad word out in public, and my daughter was appalled by it, and she confronted the lady, and the lady just about accosted my daughter because she you know, came out and said, you, you shouldn't be saying those words in public. And the lady nearly accosted my daughter because she stood up for right. Without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent. And I mean, we could stop and talk about every one of these words. Disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God. Do we not have that going on today? And then he says, having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof from such turn away. Now, how is it that he can say that they're all of these things and they have a form of godliness? Because these people will turn around as they're committing their wickedness, as they're committing their ungodly sins, and they will turn around and act as though, and claim to be a Christian, and act as though God is somehow okay with it. The perversion of the people. He says, for this, of this sort uh, are they which creep into houses and lead captive silly women, laden with sins, led away with divers' lusts, ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. It was a perverted time in their culture that, at that moment. Uh, this was a time, he says, therefore the law is slacked, verse 4, and judgment doth never go forth. Do we not live in a culture today right now, where judgment doesn't go forth, you know, where, where people will think 
that evil is good and good is evil, where people get away with, uh, especially in high places, will get away with evil. Judgment doth never go forth. The law is slacked. For the wicked doth compass about the righteous. Therefore, wrong judgment proceedeth. And people, ju judges, uh, and uh, lawmakers, and on and on we could go about the perversion. In Habakkuk's day, that's exactly what they were going through. Uh, they, were, they were going through the exact same thing, perverted judgment, and the perversion of the people. And it was a horrible time. And he begins to cry out in, in verse 2. The, verse 1 says, the burden which Habakkuk the prophet did see. Verse 2, O Lord, how long shall I cry? How long shall I cry? And thou wilt not hear. Even cry out unto thee of violence, and thou wilt not save. We have a perverted people, but we see the petition of the prophet. The petition of the prophet, how long shall I cry out about these things? How long will my voice go out and not be heard? How long do I have to cry about the evil that's proceeding from our country and my voice is not heard and you don't uh, do anything about it and judgment isn't made right? How long does that happen? The petition of the prophet, you know, we wait for the coming of the Lord, do we not? James 5, 7, be patient, therefore, brethren, unto the coming of the Lord. Behold, the husbandman waiteth for the precious fruit of the earth and hath long patience for it until he receive the early and latter rain. The farmer goes out in his field and he plows his field and he uh, prepares his field, he sows his field, and then he waits. Now, in this day, when this was written, they didn't have irrigation systems like we have today. And so today, they put the irrigation out, and they don't have to wait like they did back in this day. But in the Bible day, they had to wait. And they had long patience for it. And they waited for the coming of the rain to come and to uh, soak up the earth and to help their crops grow. And they had long patience for it. And what he's saying here is, as they, the husbandmen or the gardener, as they have long patience, they wait for the precious fruit of the earth. They have patience for the rain. They have patience for the fruit to grow. And uh, at the same way, be patient, therefore, brethren, unto the coming of the Lord. We may see evil men and seducers wax worse and worse, but we know there's coming a day where Christ is coming. There's coming a time when he will come back, and it's... It may be a long time and we may have to have long patience for it because in the beginning of the book of Acts and, and throughout the uh, epistles that were written, they were expecting Christ to come back to them. His return was imminent. That was 2,000 years ago. Is it not more ever imminent than it ever was before? But we have to wait for it. And we have to have patience for it. And we know the coming of the Lord is there. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in a moment. So we wait for the coming of the Lord. We wait for the help of the Lord. Psalm 6, O Lord, rebuke me not in thine anger, neither chasten me in thy hot displeasure. Have mercy upon me, O Lord, for I am weak. O Lord, heal me, for my bones are vexed. My soul also is sore vexed. But thou, O Lord, how long? Return, O Lord, deliver my soul. Oh, save me for thy mercy's sake, for in death there is no remembrance of thee. In the grave, who shall give thee thanks? I am weary with my groaning. All the night make I my bed to swim. I water my couch with my tears. Mine eye is consumed because of grief. It waxeth old because of mine enemies. David had to wait for God's help. But then he said, my help cometh from the Lord, which made heaven and earth. In Psalm 121. We wait for the strength of the Lord. Psalm 27, verse 14. Wait on the Lord, be of good courage, and he shall strengthen thy heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. And that wait gives a connotation not just of sitting by and, and waiting as we think of waiting today and, and not doing anything and just sitting still. But that wait gives a connotation of serving, a waiting, like waiting on tables. And so as we are waiting for the Lord to come, we are waiting on the Lord and we are serving the Lord. So we wait for the coming of the Lord. We wait for the help of the Lord. We wait for the strength of the Lord. And the petition of the prophet was, how long shall I cry? 
And does it not seem like today we cry out, Lord, how long is it going to be until justice is done? How long is it going to be until judgment is served properly, until, until judgment is served right, until right can become right again and wrong is now wrong again? And it seems that we live in a world that's all upside down and backwards. Oh, Lord, how long is it going to be that we live in a world that's upside down and backwards? But then look at verse 5, chapter 1, verse 5. Behold, behold ye among the heathen. Here's God speaking now. And regard and wonder marvelously, for I will work in your days, which ye will not believe, though it be told you. And we could go down and read through all verse, down through verse 11, and we find the pronouncement of the punishment of the people in verse 5 through verse 11. I will work a work in your days which ye will not believe, though it was told you. God says, I am going to come. I'm going to uh, bring punishment, and I'm going to bring judgment upon those who work evil. Uh, evil will always lose. Look at verse 12. Art thou not from everlasting, O Lord my God, my Holy One? We shall not die, O Lord. Thou hast ordained them for judgment, and O mighty God, thou hast established them for correction. Evil will lose. There will come a time when evil will be banished, and praise God, someday uh, we'll all have new bodies. Amen? And not just a physic, in the physical sense, but in the spiritual sense as well. That we'll be new. We'll be, uh, we're a new creature in Christ today, uh, but we'll, live, we'll have a new body uh, where there's no sin, where there's no pain, where there's no sickness. And thank God one day when he comes, we'll be given that new body in a twinkling of an eye, in a moment of time, we shall be changed. Amen. <laughs> Evil will lose. Right will always prevail. Jeremiah 119, and they shall fight against thee, but they shall not prevail against thee. For I am with thee, saith the Lord, and I will deliver thee. Right will prevail. And there will be a time, there will be a day as we, uh, as we are gathered together that, uh, that right will prevail uh, and evil will fail. So we see the perversion of the people. We see the petition of the prophet we see the pronouncement of punishment here all in in chapter one but then as we come to chapters two and three we find the response of the prophet the response that pro the prophet gave uh, toward understanding and hearing that right was going to prevail that there was going to be a punishment and a, and a judgment and that someday at some point and god said wait because it will surely come. In chapter 2, verse 3, he says, For the vision is yet appointed time, but at the end it shall speak and not lie. Though it tarry, wait for it, because it will surely come. It will not tarry. God said it's going to come, and you can rest assured that there's going to come a time when judgment will come. So what is the, prophet, what is the response of the prophet we find here in chapter 2, verse 1, he says, I will stand upon my watch, I will set upon my tower, and will watch to see what he will say to me, and I will answer when I am reproved. So we find here in chapter 2 a patient prophet. If judgment is coming, then I'm going to stand. I'm going to stand upon my watch. If judgment is coming, then I will watch and see what happens. If judgment is coming, then I will answer when I'm reproved. Uh, but I'm going to watch. I'm going to be patient for the coming of the Lord. I'm going to be patient for Christ. I'm going to be patient for uh, what God has in store. The Lord answered in verse 2. In verse 3, he says, it will surely come. Psalm 27, 14, wait on the Lord, be of good courage, and he shall strengthen thine heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. Psalm 69, verse 6, let let. Not them that wait on thee, O Lord, of hosts be ashamed for my sake. Let not those that seek thee be confounded for my sake, O God of Israel. Proverbs 20, verse 22, say thou not, I will recompense evil, but wait on the Lord, and he shall save thee. And so we as, as the people of God have got to just learn to be patient and wait for the coming of the Lord. And that's the application that we can make in our own hearts and our own minds as we look at the world around us and we see, we can say, I will stand upon my watch, I will set upon my tower. Uh, so in these days, 
There was a wall around Jerusalem. There was a wall around uh, these cities, and they would stand upon a watch. So they would climb up in the tower, and they would watch. Because in chapter 1, in verse 6, he says, Lo, I will raise up the Chaldeans, that bitter and hasty nation, which shall march through the breadth of the land to possess the dwelling places that are not theirs. So he's going to bring the Chaldeans to wipe out uh, the people and to possess the land. And he's going to bring the Chaldeans to bring the punishment and, and upon the land of, of Israel. And uh, so here is Habakkuk, and he's looking for this, and he says, I will stand upon my watch. The watch was the towers upon the corners of the town or around the town uh, that they would watch for the enemy to come. They would have a trumpet in their hand, and as the enemy began to approach uh, from a distance, they could see, or if they thought, hey, the enemy's coming, if there was a big cloud of dust, they could blow the trumpet, they could warn the people. And that trumpet, that sound of the trumpet, would, would bring the people together ready for battle. And they would take up their stations and they would get upon the wall. They would get ready at the gate. The battle would be set in array. They would prepare to defend their city. And so as Habakkuk is saying, I will stand upon my watch. I will set upon my tower. He says, I'm going to get up in that tower. And I'm going to wait and I'm going to watch for what God will do. I'm going to wait and I'm going to watch for, uh, for the coming of the Lord. And for the coming of the Chaldeans and for the judgment that's going to be per that has been pronounced that will come upon the people. And I'm going to watch. And I'm going to make sure it happens. And I'll be patient for it. If you sat upon the tower and you were a watchman, the Bible says in Ezekiel, if you blew the trumpet to warn the people, but the people didn't respond, their blood was not on your hands. Their blood was on their hands. But if the enemy comes and you blow not the trumpet, and the people die, their blood is on your hands because you didn't warn them of the evil coming. So Habakkuk is standing upon the tower. So the tower is not just a place to sit and relax and wait as far as do nothing. The tower is a place where the trumpet is blown. The tower was the place where the people were warned. The tower was the place that they would watch for the enemy to come and they would warn the people. And here Habakkuk says, I'm going to stand upon my watch. I'm going to go up into this tower. I'm going to warn the people and I'm going to see what God has to do. So we see this response of the prophet. We find a patient prophet and then look at chapter 3. Chapter 3 and verse 1. And here's our text this morning again. A prayer of Habakkuk, the prophet upon Siganoth. O oh Lord, I've heard thy speech and was afraid. So here we find a prayerful prophet. In light of God's response to Habakkuk's cry, he sets a threefold prayer to God. What is that prayer? Look with me here at verse 2. O oh Lord, I've heard thy speech and was afraid. O oh Lord, revive thy work in the midst of years. Revive thy work. In the midst of years. So this threefold prayer, number one, is revive thy work. Psalm 85, verse 6 says, Wilt thou not revive us again that thy people may rejoice in thee? Here's a people that were uh, apart from God. Here's a people who were not uh, executing judgment right. Right was wrong. Wrong was right. And, and he's saying, revive thy work. The work of God needs to go forward. We need to set upon a watch and blow the trumpet and sound the warning for the people. Revive thy work, let people be saved, let, let lives be changed, let people turn from their wicked ways and seek unto God. That's what he's saying. Oh Lord, revive thy work in the midst of the years. Uh, this has been years ongoing of evil prevailing. And he's saying, revive thy work. Let the people of God stand and blow the trumpet. Let the people of God stand and, and warn the people and, and, and find sinners to turn from their sin and find people to get right with God. Revive thy work. Then he says, and in the midst of years make known. He says, it's revealing his God's strength. Second Chronicles 16, verse 9. For the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to show himself strong in the behalf of them whose heart is perfect toward him. When he says, to the, when he says in his prayer, in the midst of years, make known. He's saying, make known your strength. 
Uh, revive thy work. Make known your strength. Show thyself strong to the people of God. Show what you can do to the people of God. Show your greatness. Show your goodness. Show your strength to the people of God. And then he says in verse, uh, there in verse 2, in wrath, remember mercy. So he says, revive thy work, reveal thy strength, and then he says, remember thy mercy. Psalm 98, verse 3, he hath remembered his mercy and his truth toward the house of Israel. All the ends of the earth have seen the salvation of God. Remember that you're a merciful God. Remember that you uh, have mercy and that your mercy goes to all generations, for thy mercy endureth forever. Remember your mercy, that when they turn from their wicked ways, that you'll heal their land. Remember thy mercy, and maybe we can turn this thing around so that it doesn't come to the place of defeat, so that it doesn't come to the place of where the Chaldeans have to come in and take over the land and destroy the people of God. And remember thy mercy, revive thy work, reveal thy strength, do something great in, thy midst, in our midst among thy people. And then number three, we find a praising prophet. We see a, a patient prophet in chapter 2. We find a prayerful prophet in, here in chapter 3, verses 1 and 2. And then in the rest of the chapter, we find a praising prophet. Now, here's where it really gets good. And here's where, here's where I want to bring everything together. So basically, we've just given a synopsis of the book of Habakkuk. We see the dialogue between God and Habakkuk as they go back and forth. Uh, and this is all in response to Habakkuk's cry out to God, How long? Here in chapter 3, in verse 3, the Bible gives us two words that are absolutely incredible. God came. God came. After all of the inner turmoil that Habakkuk went through in his heart, through all the inner turmoil of his heart and his mind that the people of God have turned from you. They're, they're in their wickedness, they're in their sin, and yet they need to turn to you. Uh, revive thy work, reveal thy strength, remember mercy. And then we find two words that are incredible. God came. God came. Habakkuk gets his answer. And as we look at this, Habakkuk looks back to a time where God came for his people. When Israel was delivered from Egypt, when they crossed the Red Sea, and he gave them victory over the promised land. As we look at verse 5, verse 5 says, before him went pestilence. So, well, back up to verse 3. God came from Teman, and the Holy One from Mount Paran, Selah, his glory, this is God, his glory covered the heavens, and the earth was full of his praise, and his brightness was as the light. He had horns coming out of his hand, and there was hiding, uh, the hiding of his power. So in verse 5, he says, before him went the pestilence. This was a time where God sent plagues upon Egypt. And, uh, and then in verse 6, the Bible says he stood and he measured the earth. This is a reference uh, to God dividing the land of Canaan to his people. And then in verse 8, we find was the Lord displeased against the rivers? Uh, was thine anger against the rivers, thy wrath against the sea? This is a reference uh, to the Red Sea and to the Jordan River. And, and uh, the Lord dividing the sea and the Jordan River, the Red Sea. And then verse 11 the sun and the moon stood still in their habitation. He stopped the sun to aid the victory of his people when Joshua was battling. You remember that? He stopped the sun. And so here we find the reference from, from verse 5 all the way down to verse 15. We find as God, uh, as, as, as Habakkuk looks back at all that God has done for his people. And all the, the things that God has done over time for his people, all the greatness that God has been, the goodness that God has led his people through. And we find here in verse 3, God came from Teman. Teman was a city or a region in southern Edom to the east of Israel. Likewise, Mount Paran, a, a mountain opposite of Teman, also was east of Israel. So in the next verses, in Habakkuk 3... Habakkuk emphasizes this theme. His glory covered the heavens. His earth was full of praise. His brightness was as the light. He had horns coming out of his hand, and there was hiding of his power. God's coming from Teman is like the rising of the sun from the east. He is shining over his people. He breaks the darkness and initiates a new day. He comes to rescue his people. God came. 
what an incredible moment and a time in our life when the trumpet blows and we'll be gathered together with him. Isn't that in your mind, isn't that one of the greatest moments that we'll ever get to witness? When, when, God, when, when God says, okay, Jesus, go, and the trumpet blows, all our heartache gone, our disappointments are gone, our physical ailments are gone. I mean, on and on we could go. God came. Aren't you looking for the coming of the Lord? Aren't you looking forward to the day when we can rest in Christ? When this earth is passed away, when this earth is no more, when we're resting in Christ, look at verse 16. So here is Habakkuk. As we come to the end of the chapter, he says, when I heard, when I heard, when I heard all of what God had done for his people, when I heard all of the things, the greatness that God had been for his people, the goodness he had, he had done for his people, all of the good things, all of the greatness, uh, all of the mercy that he's shown to his people, when I heard, my belly trembled and my lips quivered at the voice. The lips quivering, the belly trembling, it's a crying. So here's Habakkuk coming to this place where he's now heard. Habakkuk has heard God. He's heard what God has done. He remembers the times of old. He remembers the stories that have been told of the goodness of God among the children of Israel. He remembers the stories that he's heard of crossing the Red Sea, coming out of Egypt, and how God rescued his people through the plagues. He heard the great things of them going through the wilderness when they, they had water, when they, when they didn't have water, he gave them water from the rock. When the waters were bitter, he threw the tree in and the waters were made clean. And they came to uh, the place where they didn't have uh, food and sustenance and he gave them quail and he gave them manna and he provided for them time and time again and he did all the greatness and all of these good things. And Habakkuk is now looking, and he says, I heard my belly quivered, uh, or my lips quivered, my belly trembled, and it was a cry, and he began to weep, and he began to sob as he heard all the great things that God had done for his people in the past. And now look what he says. I heard my, my belly trembled, my lips quivered at the voice, rottenness entered in my bones, and I trembled in myself. He trembled at the judgment of the Lord. Look at verse 17. He says, although the fig tree shall not blossom, neither shall the fruit be in the vines, the labor of the olive shall fail, the fields shall yield no meat, the flock shall be cut off from the fold, there shall be no herd in the stalls. So all of the judgment of God, all of the things that are going to happen, and he's uh, he's trembling at the judgment of God. So he's crying uh, because of the good things of God. He's, re he's rejoicing, as it were, in that. But he realizes that there's judgment coming, and he trembles at the judgment. And then he says, in there in verse 16, in the middle of the verse, that I might rest in the day of trouble when he cometh up unto the people. He will invade them with his troops. So he hears... What God has done for his people, he trembles at the judgment of the Lord. But then look at verse 18. He rested. He said, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will joy in the God of my salvation. I can rejoice in God even though the evil is abounding. I can rejoice in God even though uh, the world seems turned upside down. I can rejoice in God even though things aren't going my way. I can rejoice in God. I can joy in the God of my salvation even when trouble has hit and it seems overwhelming in my heart and my mind and I'm crying because of the trouble and I'm crying because of what God has done for us in the past and I see the mercy of God uh, of what he's done in the past and I see the trouble that's headed and I see the the judgment of God coming and I can still at that moment at that time I can still rest in God I can joy in the God of my salvation I can rejoice why look at verse 19 the Lord God is my strength 
and he will make my feet like hinds feet. He will make me to walk upon my high places. So it's God, when I'm in the lowest part of my valley, when it seems like all hope is gone, when I'm in the deepest part of destruction in my heart and mind, and my soul is in, the, in depression, I can rest in God. Why? Because he's going to make my feet like hinds feet. He's going to make me to walk in high places. He's going to be my strength that allows me to come out of that pit and up out of the valley, up onto the mountaintop, and he's going to make my feet like hind's feet because I can rejoice in God because he's going to do these great things for me. Wow, how incredible is the book of Habakkuk. And we thought it was just an Old Testament book. He's going to make my feet like hind's feet. He's going to give me strength when my feet are weary, when my mind is weary, when I feel like I just can't go any further, when it seems like the world is overwhelming, when it seems like evil is prevailing, yet he's going to allow me to experience the mountaintop. Therefore, I will joy in the God of my salvation. I will rejoice in the Lord. Though all these things go wrong, we can still rejoice in Christ. We can still rejoice in God because he's our strength. Because he's going to make our feet like hinds feet. Though it may not seem that right is going to prevail, remember that God has promised to come again. We can rest in the promise that he gave, because we've heard what he's done in the past, and we know that he's going to come for his people again. He came when they were in Egypt, in bondage. He came when they were in captivity in, to the Midianites, in the book of Judges. He came when they were in bondage to the Chaldeans. He came when they were in bondage and captivity in Babylon. He came physically when they were in bondage to the Romans. He came the first time, the first advent. And we know because he came and he worked for his people that he's coming again. Because he promised in, the, in his word that he would. And we can look at the past and we can say, you know what, he promised that he would come. He did. And now he's promising that he's going to come again. And we know that he will. Father, we thank you for your goodness. Thank you for the book of Habakkuk. What a great study that it is for us. What a great challenge it is that we stand upon our tower and that we proclaim Christ. That we stand upon our tower and we serve the Lord. We wait and we blow the trumpet and proclaim Christ. And that we know that the coming of the Lord is, is near. You came once. We know you're coming again. Help us in these hours to not lose faith, not lose hope, but that we know that you're coming. In Jesus' name, with our heads bowed, our eyes closed, would you stand with me? The piano will begin to play. If God has spoken your heart in any way, you can come. If you don't know for sure that you're going to heaven, maybe you've never trusted Jesus Christ as your Savior, he is coming. He's coming one day to take all of those who are saved Brother Brian's down here in the front. If you've never been born again, you don't know for sure you're going to heaven, uh, just come and take him by the hand and he'll find someone to share the gospel with you so that you can be saved as well. The altar is open. If God has spoken to your heart, Softly and tenderly, Jesus is calling.
Brother Jerry, would you dismiss us in prayer, please?